Welcome to you all out there. Uh, on behalf of Mass Peace Action, I'd like to welcome you all. I'm Susan Mursky, chair of our Nuclear Disarmament Working Group. In this period of time when nuclear weapons are more prevalent and the threat of nuclear war more likely, our peace and anti-war, anti-nuclear movement is struggling. We need help and we need perspective. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Vincent Entande. A professor, historian, and author, Dr. Entande is widely considered the preeminent authority on the intersection of race and nuclear weapons. He is a professor of history and the director of the Institute for Race, Justice, and Civic Engagement at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. From 2009 to 2017, he was a director of research for American University's Nuclear Studies Institute in Washington, DC. He's the author of African Americans Against the Bomb, Nuclear Weapons, Colonialism, and the Black Freedom Movement. And now, hot off the press, saving the world from nuclear war. Dr. Vincent Intande, please. Thank you. Um, it's always special to be with Mass Peace Action and all the amazing work that you guys uh, have done over the years and continue to do. Um, so I have a special place in my heart for Mass Peace Action. And I see some folks on here that probably not only were at the June 12th rally, uh, but actually helped organize it. So um, some of you probably all know the subject much better than me from a first person account. Um, but I, I, um, I wanna thank you all for having me tonight. Um, so let me begin with uh, a couple couple quotes here. Um, I will not only kill them, I will kill their family members. The United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability. Let there be an arms race. We will outspend Russia and China into oblivion to win a new arms race. These are the words of former President Donald Trump. And while in office, he repeatedly threatened to use nuclear weapons, uh, talked about resuming nuclear testing, withdrew from almost every nuclear weapons treaty there was, including the Iran nuclear deal. And when Trump was in office, I started seeing that many for the first time started thinking about all things nuclear. Uh, they realized that the president had the sole authority to end life on the planet uh, and that no one could stop him. Now fear only increased when you had Putin's threats and the invasion, the illegal invasion of Ukraine. And so this got me thinking, can we as organizers, can people organize around fear? And I believe that you can, but only if you also offer the hope. And that's why I started writing this book. Looking at the nuclear disarmament movement in the 1980s, and specifically the June 12, 1982 march and rally, I wanted to show a couple things. Um, one, I wanted to show that this movement has always been more diverse than previously talked about. Uh, looking at this rally, I wanted to show that it was organized and led by members of the LGBTQ community, by women, by people of color, and that in our narrative, so much of their voices are silenced. They are not seen, they are not heard, and representation matters. So how is a young organizer, how is somebody that is young, a person of color, somebody from the LGBTQ community, how can they want to be involved in this movement if they don't see themselves in this movement? Because that's what we do in history. We try to find somebody when we're younger that we can identify with, right? Somebody that we can share a common ancestry with. The second thing is I wanted to show, especially young organizers today, that the same issues they're dealing with were the same issues that were dealt with back then. Racism within the movement, homophobia, patriarchy, misogyny. And so how did organizers back then navigate this terrain so that younger organizers today could learn from it? I wanted to show organizers today that we were able to put a million people in the streets to stop the arms race without a cell phone, without social media, without email, but somehow they did it, right? And 
I also wanted to show that contrary to popular belief, grassroots organizing actually does move the needle. And in this case, did move the needle and influence the Reagan administration to change course on nuclear weapons. And so those were some of the main things that I wanted to focus on um, and that I, I found actually through interviews, through research, through archival work, um, looking at this micro history specifically on the June 12th rally. So when the United Nations announced they were going to have this second special session on disarmament and veteran activists started um, thinking about doing something big for this, when we look at the 1980s and a lot of the books already written about the 1980s, it, re it gets reduced down to either two things. One, a very top-down approach looking at uh, Reagan and Gorbachev as being the ones that ended the Cold War, not looking at how they were pushed, not looking at the role of individuals in grassroots organizing and how it pushed Reagan to do this. The other thing um, is to look at the nuclear freeze campaign, which was only one part of this. Uh, this was not, and this was made very clear by everybody I interviewed, this was not a freeze rally. That freeze was only one part of this. An important piece, but not the be all end all when it came to this rally and, and the movement in the 80s. They also knew that to pull something of the magnitude off that they were thinking about, they were going to have to transcend race and class and religion. They were going to have to reach constituencies that they don't normally uh, work with in progressive circles. They were going to have to get Broadway involved. They were going to have to get celebrities, the Habaksha. They were going to have to get so many different groups involved. And so how do you do this? How do you bring them together? Well, one word, Reagan. Reagan is the catalyst. Um, that actually brings up, that reawakens this movement, if you will, because coming out of the 1970s, coming out of the Vietnam War, on the left, on the progressive side, there were many who were exhausted, and understandably so. They had been fighting for civil rights, the women's liberation movement, Stonewall, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and they were suffering PTSD themselves. Some of them had to go underground or flee the country. Others were in jail for crimes they didn't commit. Um, so they were they were exhausted at this point. And at the same time, during that period, when we focus a lot on those who were in the streets protesting and trying to end the Vietnam War, underneath the surface, the right got really good at organizing. Uh, you know, they had tried with, to undo the New Deal really since FDR. And after JFK, after Lyndon Johnson, they tried with Barry Goldwater in 64 and he got crushed. They try with Nixon and he's an embarrassment. And so now this perfect storm is brewing where you have things happening uh, out of his control with the Carter administration. You have the Iranian revolution happening. You have uh, Ted, uh, Ted Kennedy primarying Carter, which didn't help. And here is Reagan now, All this is all setting up for the, for the perfect win. Uh, right wing think tanks and the merging of the, of the moral majority happens in the 70s. They get really good at direct mailing campaigns in places like Orange County in California. And so this all leads to Reagan coming into power. And when Reagan does, uh, you know, he thought arms control was appeasement. He went against every single disarmament treaty that we had. He was somebody that talked about preemptive nuclear strikes. Uh, he wanted to, you know, push for the new MX missile. And then if you look at who he surrounds himself with, Gene Kirkpatrick, Secretary of State Alexander Hay, Casper Weinberger at Defense, uh, William Casey at CIA, um, I could go on and on, as Vice President uh, Bush, they were all speaking about winning a nuclear war. When cabinet officials were now testifying to get approved by Congress in the Reagan administration, they were saying things like, well, only 10 million people will die. That's not all the population. If every person has a shovel and just digs a hole and puts a door over it, we can survive this. That's okay. This was the type of rhetoric that was coming out of the Reagan administration. Now you also couple that with his spending. He backs it up. Over his terms, his two terms, he spent $2.7 trillion dollars on, on defense, many on nuclear weapons. And at the same time, to make up for that, he's not taxing the rich. No, instead he cuts programs for the poor. Um, in the early eighties, he cuts $26 billion. 24% of children under the age of six in his first term were now living in poverty. Uh, over 1 million children depended on free school lunches that were now cut to pay for his nuclear arsenal. You had over 12 million children declared poor in parts of Detroit. Uh, children were one third of the children were dying before their first birthday because of his policies. 
And so many started putting those connections together of the money being spent on nuclear weapons under Reagan and the money that was they were not receiving to help their own communities, especially uh, in black and brown communities. At the same time, we started to see in the early 80s um, a real rise in nuclear culture. And what I mean is you, it wasn't just a, the threat or the fear of Russia and the US having nuclear war. It was also things like MTV. MTV first started in the 80s, back when they actually played music videos. And if you started to look at the music at that time, you really couldn't get away from nuclear weapons. There were groups like Phil Collins and Genesis, who actually had videos uh, in which Reagan and Gorbachev were puppets, and, and Reagan wakes up with, with Alzheimer's and hits the wrong button, he hits the, the and, and blows up the world. And you had the song you may have heard uh, when you first came in with Sting, the Russians, um, Men at Work, there were all different groups. Uh, you had things like Three Mile Island, of course, in 1979, which really affected the way people thought of nuclear power, nuclear energy, and nuclear waste. So there was so much happening, especially with literature. In fact, uh, between 1979 and 1983, over 130 anti-nuclear books were published. That was highlighted on the cover of Time magazine, uh, talking about the anti-nuclear movement. Two of the most important and most notable books in the 80s was The Unforgettable Fire, which if you've never seen it, is more like a coffee table book with images dr uh, drawn by atomic bomb survivors. And of course, Jonathan Shell's The Fate of the Earth, uh, which really shook so many people to their core. And so now we see a movement that had always been there, but really had sh you know, shifted during the, the 60s and 70s on the Vietnam War, reawaken with the emergence of Reagan. So groups like SANE, established groups like the Union of Concerned Scientists, Positions for Social Responsibility, all saw their membership start to rise in the 80s. But you also now saw an emergence of new groups. You saw things like architects for nuclear disarmament, nurses for nuclear disarmament, athletes united for peace, blacks against nukes. I mean, there were groups performing artists for nuclear disarmament. It was happening in all different areas of our society. And so the time was really right. And, and, and as much as Reagan is this kind of force that, that awakens the movement, now you have, and I don't need to tell you who Randy Forsberg is from where you guys all are, but she comes out with the freeze, the freeze initiative, right? And the beauty about the freeze initiative, and, and people I interviewed, some said it didn't go far enough or you know, and so on and so forth. But the, the key with the freeze initiative to not test, produce, or deploy nuclear weapons was its simplicity. Right, you didn't need a physics degree to understand it. Right, Malcolm X used to always say, "Make it plain," because he understood that yes, he could go into the halls of Oxford and debate the best minds in the world, which he did in 1964. But he could also reach the boy on the block. He could reach the person who maybe wasn't that educated. That's a rare ability to do both, and he understood that. That's why he always said, "Make it plain," and that's the beauty of what Forsberg was doing. Right, um, and it provided agency. And that's an important piece of organizing. It gave something tangible that, that people felt they could do. They could go to get it on a ballot initiative, right? They could go to their congressmen. They could go to their councils, their schools, their churches, and get people to sign on to this. So it was incredibly important, especially as a tool after the rally in March, to give people something to do when they went home from this and continue this work. And I also started looking at um, women and how influential they were. So not just Randy Forsberg, but people like Frances Farley, the state senator out of Utah, who worked with Ron Dellums and really pushed the Mormon church and others in Utah to formally come out against Reagan and the MX missile because he wanted to have it housed in Utah. And of course, Helen Keldicott. I interviewed Helen for this book and, you know, Helen Keldicott, who, um, is known for you know for the, being the president of PSR and also starting Women's Action for Nuclear Disarmament. But the key to Helen Keldicott was her going everywhere she could and talking about the human consequences of nuclear war, right? Going on lady speaking in ladies journal, going on talk shows on Good Morning America, on Donahue, anywhere she could, and constantly speaking about this. So it was always in the mainstream and having the charisma, having the right message, knowing how to communicate that, that was all incredibly important. And so in 1981, in the winter of 81, um, there were a group of activists, David McReynolds and Cora Weiss and David Courtright, Mike Meyerson, that decided to do something big for the second special session on disarmament. 
But of course, this is where the hard part begins now, right? What was the slogan going to be? How are they going to pull this off? Where were they going to get the money? Um, and a big piece was, should this be a singular issue? Should it be just about the arms race? Or should we open this up to other issues, which became a big, big problem when they were organizing? And if we are, you know, most of the folks that I interviewed for this, when I asked about who really kind of took the reins with leadership or who started this, a lot of them pushed back and said, it's not about that. That's an ego thing. Who cares, right? Uh, one or two try to take full credit, but most people said it's a collective, you know, issue here. But for my research, if we're looking for one person who was the organizer of this, of this rally in March, without question, it was Leslie Kagan. Um, Leslie Kagan was, I mean, she's been a tour de force for so many years and, and that quite frankly continues to be. And, and most of the organizers had a background where they grew up with civil defense and with the Cuban Missile Crisis and, you know, and, and their parents were activists and, and about these issues. Um, and of course, Leslie had to deal with being openly gay at the time and faced homophobia. You know, it wasn't like it was today where it was widely accepted. So that piece was always there as well. Um, Another young activist at the time who was so important in this was Kathy Engel, uh, an amazing poet and writer. She teaches at NYU right now. And Kathy was in charge of getting the Broadway community, celebrities, poets, dancers, and really getting the art world involved in this. And, um, and then the third, I would say, is Riverside Church, which, of course, many of us know Riverside, know Riverside from uh, Dr. King's famous Beyond Vietnam speech, April 4th, 1967, when he calls the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And out of that was William Sloan Coffin Jr. and Cora Weiss, who was a long season activist as well. A lot of the money came from, when we look at how did they raise money for this, it came from artists. Concerts by uh, Jackson Brown and Bruce Springsteen and Gil Scott Heron and Pete Seeger. Um, this is how they were raising their money. Broadway really gets involved. I can't stress enough the importance of the arts community in this entire thing. Um, you know, when you look at it the day of, uh, Kathy had poets on every corner of New York City leading up from the UN to Central Park. Imagine that hearing poets on every block, right? Bread for, uh, bread for puppets, the, the giant paper mache and, the, and the, the puppetry that they had going on there. Um, there was so much of the art world involved. Dancers for disarmament, they put in the playbills, all sorts of information about disarmament and why they should be against nuclear weapons. People like Meryl Streep and Roy Scheider and Harry Belafonte, so many of them that were all involved in this. Which again, when you have art involved in this, that's just, it, 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 so, it adds so much to, to, to the movement. Um, in fact, the poster you see behind me is one of the official posters. Um, and it's, it's in the book. I asked the artist if I could reprint it. And I interviewed the artist that, that made that poster. And the poster is a dove. And then the dove has six, uh, five, two, four, five legs coming out of it. But if you notice, the legs are all different different races, high heels, boots, pants, jeans, shorts, all different. And the reason is because he wanted to make clear that this movement was intersectional before intersectionality was a cool word. He wanted to make clear that this actually, this issue reached so many different people and that's how many people were involved in this. So it was really important when we look at the art world and their role in this. Even the slogan, reverse the arms race and fund human needs was, of, you know, people had, you know, disagreements about that as well. Um, and also a big part of this, I, I cannot press upon this enough, was the importance of getting the Habaksha, the atomic bomb survivors here to march in this rally, which David McReynolds, uh, working with the War Resisters League, had a huge role in doing. Of course, the United States government tried to stop that with the McCarran Act and actually tried to stop them from entering a lot of them, uh, but after lawsuits relented. And so, now let's look at some of the issues that were involved. Well, one big thing was this issue of intersectionality, right? There were those uh, under Herbert, uh, Reverend Herbert Daughtry and the Black United Front, the Third World People's Coalition. They wanted to make sure that race was addressed in this, where the money was being spent, uh, who is victims of nuclear testing and nuclear war, how uranium mining, that race is intersected with this. 
Uh, others wanted to make sure that what was happening in El Salvador was addressed. I see Joe Gerson, Gerson on here, and he was one of those few that was championing to make sure that when Israel uh, invaded Lebanon, that that was included in this. Um, but others were, you know, pushing back on that, saying, no, it should be an, only a nuclear freeze rally and things of this nature. So that was not easy to navigate through. And it almost all falls apart with what's known now from all the interviews I did as the corporate coup, everybody seemed to call it. And there was this moment where, led by Cora Weiss, uh, and some of the more pacifist groups decided they were going to oust the more, what they deemed the more radical groups like the Black United Front, and those that wanted to have an intersectional approach and look at these larger issues of militarism, kick them out completely and have a different rally. And this really split it. It was really bad. The meetings were bad. The letters I saw go back and forth, especially about Cora, were bad. And it almost all fell apart. And, you know, talking to Leslie and others about how they managed to keep this coalition together, you know, some even said the rally happened not, not because of the June 12th committee, in spite of, because it got so prickly at times, so, you know, in meetings and stuff. And um, even the issue of homophobia, there was all these separate task force. And when the LGBT community said, there's no task force for us, uh, some of those from the from that other side said, yeah, we don't need that. Well, that's not relevant. We don't want to highlight that, you know. Um, and actually, they said it's because Catholics don't want that. Uh, well, there were a couple of Catholic nuns in the meeting and the Catholic nuns spoke up and said, don't blame this on us. We don't care if there's uh, gay people in this rally at all. That's not our that's not our fight. And uh, actually, um, again, at the rally, you had multiple members of the LGBTQ community that spoke to the crowd that day. And so. When I ask them, when I talk to folks about intersectionality and how that was handled, they were very clear that they, they didn't want to have an alphabet soup of every single issue on stage, right? But at the same point, they understood how these things were connected. And some, like Randy Keller in later years said, my thinking wasn't advanced. Now I realize how these things are connected and that we do need to put these issues together. Um, but back then, I just, that wasn't really my thinking. And so there was a lot of kind of going back and looking. But if you if you take a sample of the signs, uh, the posters, the, the demographics of the people were there, the intersectional approach won, right? I mean, on stage that day, you had Rita Marley and Shaka Khan and Gil Scott Heron and Sweet Honey in the Rock. You had Coretta Scott King talking to the crowd, thousands of people pouring out of bed in Harlem. Um, you know, so... Filipino delegations, uh, the Hispanic community was involved. So it was uh, clearly intersectional. You may not see that from an aerial photo, but if you were on the ground, like I'm sure many of you were, uh, you can attest to that. And I don't think any of them thought it was gonna be as big as it was. Uh, but when they got there, Leslie and a couple went there at seven in the morning and they started to see how many people had slept overnight. Uh, they started getting reports in about the trains. They start all being sold out, added carts being, you know, uh, added to train service. They started hearing about parking. They started hearing about all of this thing, all of the people coming in and realized it was going to be bigger than they ever could have possibly imagined. And so it starts at the, at the UN and then makes its way to Central Park. But so many never even got into Central Park because there were so many people there. And of, of the speeches that I reviewed, and, and I saw maybe briefly in the chat, I didn't check it, but yes, of course, Orson Welles spoke and, uh, and, and, and uh, Yoko Ono was backstage. She actually didn't want to come out and speak. And there was a real hush backstage when she got out of, out of the limo. And, um, and of, the, of the speeches, probably the two that I think resonated the most was certainly held in Caldecott's where she ad-libbed, she never had anything prepared in her famous line of, there are no communist babies, no capitalist baby, a baby is just a baby. And also Randy Forsberg, um, when she said the big line of, yes, we've done it, but we will go home and organize. And that was a key piece of this. That's not just a rally. It's what you do after this that is so important. And it, I mean, the, the reality is when we look at our history and this is so ignored, this is the largest single rally in United States history because we also had the sister rally going on on the West Coast a week before. You had also rallies going on in Tokyo. Um, this was the largest, if you look at the freeze campaign, you can make the argument the largest citizen-led mobilization in U.S. history. And so 
the other piece of this is, you know, people reflected to me about the day, the weather that day, the attitude of even the police that day, that there was no garbage at all after the rally. Everybody picked up everything. Um, the spirit of the Native American community there, Russell Means and Winona LaDuke and others, it was just such a, a, a feeling of, of triumph, of we're going to do this. And afterwards, I mean, uh, there were 30 million signed petitions that the Japanese brought over to deliver to the UN. And two days later, this also often gets forgotten, it was the civil disobedience on, on uh, June 14th where people had set it up ahead of time to get arrested. Uh, and there was a, a huge die-in and sit-in and acts of civil disobedience against the nuclear powers. And so one thing I wanted to look at after examining this was the legacy, right? Have we been successful in the nuclear disarmament movement or not? And how do we judge that? Because it's not an easy one, right? It really isn't. There, were no, there was no major consensus that came out of the UN as a result of this. Um, Reagan's officials, uh, his cabinet said he didn't pay any attention, that he was at Camp David, they didn't even care about any of this. Um, you had Trump with his nuclear rhetoric that I said in the beginning. You have China, North Korea, uh, we see Putin now and what he's doing. So it'd be very easy to say we're failing, right? We've taken steps back. But the reality is, years later, Nancy Reagan, Reagan's director of public affairs, his head pollster, uh, George Schultz, Casper Weinberger, all said years later, they absolutely were aware of what was happening on June 12th. They knew they had to change course because a million people were in the streets. And it absolutely played a role in their decisions to change course on nuclear weapons. And that is why, in part, we end up with the INF Treaty in 1987, where we eliminate with the Soviet Union land-based ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and missile launchers throughout Europe. Now, we could have actually eliminated all nuclear weapons, right? The problem was at that golden hour when Gorbachev says, let's do this, let's get rid of them all, if you just will, it will, will, will put your, your, your Star Wars plans, keep them in the laboratory for 10 years, and Reagan says no. That we could have done it right then and there. But we still got something with the INF Treaty. Helen Keldekotics, I think of all the people I, I talked to for this book, she was maybe the most pessimistic of, of not being successful. Um, Others like Leslie said it, it you know, it, it mattered what we didn't know at the time until people went home and saw the action that they were doing. You know, but even if there's not a, a concrete thing that comes out of it, it's also the idea of bringing people together. There's something to say about that, where you're surrounded by people and you know you're not alone in this world in fighting this. That matters. Um, we just lost Michael Crapin, who was founded the Stimson Center. We lost him not too long ago. And, you know, he made a great point before he passed, which was in 1989, we had in the world 70,300 nuclear weapons. Um, now we have 13,100. Is that really, are we not going to say that success from where we were to where we are at in some way? But how I look at it is it's a long movement. These movements are not compartmentalized. The movement to eliminate nuclear weapons started in 1945, and it continues to this day. And without the Habaksha and the atomic scientists and, and religious folks in the black community, you don't get SANE and UCS and PSR. Without them, you don't get June 12th. And without June 12th, you don't get the TPNW and the emergence of ICANN. Who would have thought, if you would have asked those folks on the ground, Maybe they wouldn't believe it. They seemed so optimistic back then in 82 that all these years later in 2017, over 120 nations, most of them from the global South, would have got the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons officially enforced. That is incredible. Incredible. Um, and what you, if you look at the TPNW, it's also, to me, very similar to the Nuclear Freeze Initiative in that you don't need 
a degree in physics to understand the TPNW. And you can take that TPNW as a tool to stigmatize nuclear weapons like we've done with landmines and chemical weapons. You can take it to your city councils. You can do what they did in New York City and get $415 million out of the city's pension fund from nuclear weapons ma manufacturers. That's incredible. That's important work. And so I think the lessons to take out of this is that there is agency for all of us, especially younger folks out there that we can't organize around fear, but we must provide that hope. And that this movement has been and always will be intersectional. Can this be done again? I don't know. Times have changed. Um, technology has changed. Maybe we do something better. But what I hope the folks that read my book, I hope they find hope in it. I hope they are educated. They are motivated and they are inspired to once again take up that anti-nuclear banner. Because as I was writing this, Jack O'Dell had passed away while I was writing this and the book became all the more important for me to finish. And the thing that ran through my head through all of this and why this work is so important is perhaps best put in the words of Audre Lorde, the great poet, survival is the greatest gift of love. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Vincent, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, there are questions pouring in, as you might imagine. So I'm going to take them just in the order we're receiving them. Um, so the first uh, question is, says, is to avoid nuclear war a sufficient reason by itself to oppose continuing to send weapons to Ukraine? Um, so and I'm just going to, in my opinion, I would disagree with that. Um, I think uh, it would be the same thing as if we said, are we going to, you know, of course, it's different with nuclear weapons, but are we going to stop protecting or sending weapons uh, and, and let Hitler take over? I mean, I think that's the situation we're essentially in with Putin. I think Putin is a disgusting monster that needs to be stopped. And the only, if he doesn't get stopped in Ukraine, he'll just continue the march uh, on and on. And um, I think the lesson, if any, that needs to be taken with the issue of Ukrainian nuclear weapons is that uh, deterrence does not work, right? And the fact of the matter is that if he had, if he did not have nuclear weapons, this would be done already. We would have gone in, we would have taken care of this. But the fact that he hangs nuclear weapons over our head, the fact that he uses them as blackmail, he threatens to use them, is why we can't do more in Ukraine right now. Um, and so it's a very dangerous time with nuclear weapons, um, especially with what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, I absolutely would, I, I can't recommend this book enough if you want to learn more about the issue of um, nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Um, it couldn't have been a more timely book. It's called Inheriting the Bomb, the Collapse of the USSR and the Nuclear Disarmament of Ukraine. I, I really have, um, would, would highly recommend that. So, um, but again, that's just my own personal opinion on, on that front, that I don't think that if we all of a sudden halted sending weapons to Ukraine to help these poor people, that uh, all of a sudden that would help nuclear disarmament. I don't, I don't see how that plays out. But again, that's just my own personal opinion on that. Um, it's certainly not, not covered. The, the only part of that that's covered in the book is just that when I started looking at with Putin threats, um, even at the time I was writing this, I think New York City actually put out a PSA of what to do if, you're, if, if a nuclear attack breaks out. So I was just seeing this kind of heightened awareness of all things nuclear that I hadn't seen since I grew up in the 1980s and said, you know, here is this moment that everybody's really scared well, isn't that the right time to then go back and look at, in some ways, when we were the most successful against nuclear weapons with, with this rally, putting a million people in the streets? And that's kind of where that where the idea came from. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see one more question about, um, is the danger of nuclear weapons now as great as it was at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, I uh, I wasn't alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was born seventy five, but I will tell you that um, a lot of people um, that I interviewed certainly that was their catalyst in many ways, and remember it. And uh, my mentor for a lot of years was um, Tom Hayden. Uh, he was a dear friend and mentor of mine, and and Tom told me once that when the Cuban Missile Crisis was going on. He uh, went out uh, one night and got a cheeseburger and a milkshake, his favorite meal, because he thought that was going to be the last meal he ever had. He really thought this was it. Um, and so I don't know what it was like, you know, to be alive during that time. But um, a lot of folks have said this is the closest we've been since then. So the thing that I, 
you know, kind of grapple with when we compare these times of history is whether it's the 80s, whether it's the Cuban Missile Crisis, is why when we have this kind, again, this kind of fear of Russia, North Korea, at the time when Trump had nuclear weapons, you know, was in control of them, um, why aren't more people out there, right? And that's something we have to figure out. Why is there not more young folks out there on this? And there's a lot of, you know, some people said to me, well, the reason um, the reason that there was more younger folks involved in the 80s is because they didn't have all the issues they have today. You know, today there's police brutality and there is abject poverty and there is COVID and there's all these things. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but in the 80s, those things existed too. Maybe not COVID, but there was certainly police brutality in the 1980s, right? There was certainly an AIDS epidemic. There was a war on drugs. There were all of these issues. But a lot of these, these groups just shifted uh, lanes and realized that none of those things will matter if we're dead from nuclear war. So we've got to prevent this somehow um, and got involved. So, um, but yeah, I think it's a really dangerous time right now uh, where it's just this kind of, you know, and I think the U.S. should be the leaders in, in de-escalating and starting disarmament. Um, we were the only ones to use nuclear weapons. Uh, I don't think we unilaterally just disarm everything, you know, move them all, but we certainly can start you know, being the leaders in that regard. And it really frustrates me with the TPNW, especially that the nuclear powers are not only against it, but actively boycott it, right? And what does that say, right? That juxtaposition that you have 120 nations, mostly from the global South, so many from Africa throughout Latin America, leading the fight to ban nuclear weapons. On the other side, you have these nuclear powers like the US, the UK, and France, all with their own history of slavery and colonialism, right? Russia with its own history of internal uh, slavery, right? And, and, and what they have in common really is this, this utter contempt for life, and in many cases, black life. And so, um, you know, but we're starting to see cracks in that. I was at the first meeting of states party for the TPNW in Vienna last year, and um, Germany was an observer. We saw Australia come out recently and say they were not going to, you know, criticize it publicly anymore, even though they still fall under certain umbrellas. So there's certain things like that that we're hopefully seeing some cracks. And again, it's not the be all end all. It's a tool. It's a tool to use to stigmatize nuclear weapons, and uh, hopefully we can, you know, use that as a as a springboard to to keep 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 working on this issue. Thank you. Thanks. What was the role of scientists in informing Reagan and Gorbachev about the nuclear winter, the effects of nuclear winter? Thank you. There's probably um, people on here that would know that answer more than me, but because I didn't focus too much on the scientists, but what I did read or what I did gather in research was that scientists were out there publicly um, advocating against his policies. But again, he was very much like uh, Truman in his second term where he and, and Bush in, in his term in which Reagan just surrounded himself with yes men, surrounded himself with people that were not going to go against him. And he wasn't somebody like Kennedy that brought in all sorts of different perspectives. It was willing to listen to different perspectives and, you know, and think about these things. So I don't know how much actual influence they ever had on him, um, to be quite honest. Okay. Thank you. Let's uh, switch over uh, to uh, protests and mobilizing. So what will it take, in your view, to mobilize the public now? Um, so a couple things. It's, it's, I'm not naive to the fact that nuclear disarmament is a difficult issue for younger folks to get involved with because, you know, like climate change, again, it's very tangible. You can see the fires. You can see the, the, the floods. You can see it. And you can mobilize for things like Keystone or Standing Rock. Those are tangible things you can fight for. And even if they're not the be all end all, they're just things you can say, we won, we, we did this. That's harder to do. When you start talking about ICBMs and no first use and, and sole authority, kids' eyes glaze over, you know? And then you do have kids that say, okay, well, I, I'm trying to pay student loans, not get killed by the police on the way to school, um, you know, take 15 credits working two jobs, giving money to my family, oh, and by the way, stop nuclear war, let me know when I have time for that. So I get it. Um, but part of that is, is one, diversifying this movement, right? Um, number two is we have to look much earlier in how we organize. Now, I know that won't be the, the, the silver bullet for today, but again, a lot of the work we're doing is for future generations. This is, this is not for us. The reality is when we go, there's probably still going to be nuclear weapons on this planet. It's not for us, for other generations. And part of that is you got to start much earlier. My students at 18, 19 years old should not be coming to my classroom and never having read John Hershey's Hiroshima. That's insane. 
that, that they, they don't know anything about it. They don't learn about it in school. They've never read about it, nothing. So we've got to start at the elementary school level. We got to figure out ways to get this in the curriculums and the junior high level, get it into the art classes, the music classes, the English classes, write the lesson plans, help the teachers get it in, right? We have figured out ways at a very young age to help students learn about the middle passage and the slave trade, but we haven't done that with nuclear weapons and we can't. So we've got to look at new ways of getting and getting kids much younger involved so that when they grow up, they see this as a reasonable career path of being involved in this movement. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is we have to stop siloing the issue of STEM and humanities. It is insane that a kid can go and be a physics major in college and never take a class on philosophy or history and learn about the human effects of nuclear weapons, right? Why are we siloing these things and forcing kids you either take this in humanities or here in STEM? Um, for That makes no sense to me at all. So, and then, you know, again, looking outside the back, something I think has been really wonderful that has been done recently is if you've never seen it is the VR experience of on the morning you wake I would highly recommend you you getting that on the morning you wake is um if you remember in Hawaii a couple of years ago, everybody that lived in Hawaii got a text message uh, that said there was an ICBM on the way and for 38 minutes everybody in Hawaii thought they were going to die. Well, Games for Change created a VR experience with the Oculus that puts you in Hawaii for those 38 minutes. And it is incredibly done. I mean, incredible. And Games for Change, if you want to bring them to your organization, your school, they will send an expert out. They will bring the headsets. They will bring a dozen or 20 headsets out. They'll set the whole thing up. They'll do the whole thing for you. And it's just another medium to get to younger students and younger people to really you know, see this, this issue in a new light, no pun intended, and really get involved. So we got to think of different ways like that. And I think I can, and, and, and what they've done with the TPNW is really the model going forward, um, you know, to, uh, of things that, that, that we should be looking at and how we should work on this. Okay. Um, so uh, bring us into the immediate. What do you make of Joe Biden saying in his parting speech in 2017, if we want a world without nuclear weapons, the United States must take an, the initiative to lead us there. Moreover, because we are the only nation to have ever used nuclear weapons, we have a great moral responsibility to lead the charge. Your comment. Uh, great words, but words are words. We need action. We need we need deeds, right? So that doesn't matter if, you know, uh, it was President Obama and when he visited the Holocaust Museum that said, um, remembrance without resolve means nothing and awareness without action is a hollow gesture. So it's, you know, that if you're, those are your sentiments, that's great. But if you're still pouring a trillion dollars into new nuclear weapons, if you're refusing again to uh, disarm in any way, um, then that's, if you're, that, that's not helping. If you're constantly boycotting and telling allies not to go along with the TPNW. But again, like when Obama, um, when he wasn't doing things that, uh, you know, there were things he did that I really liked and then things he did that I obviously didn't like. And, but I didn't put that on him. I put it on us because he never said, yes, I can. He said, yes, we can. So just like him with Joe Biden, if, if, if he is not doing something we like, then it's on us to push him to do something that we like. And that has to happen, uh, whether that's through lobbying in Congress, whether that's being a foot soldier for for those that are, are doing what we want versus those who are not. But I mean, it can't, you know, no president's going to act regardless of party unless we push them to act. And the fear that I have with Joe Biden is, you know, when Trump was president, I always, we always talk about this with my students is when it comes to voting, forget party, who, if we are ever faced with another Cuban Missile Christ, who do we want sitting in Kennedy's seat, right? That's the most important question. And so for a lot of people, when Trump was president, they were freaked out. They were like, he's in Kennedy's seat right now. And I, you know, some people would say, oh, well, you know, if he went to do it, uh, to turn the keys that uh, somebody in the military would tackle him before he got to the nuclear football. No, nope, that's not how it works. And so they really feared that. Well, when you get then somebody like President Biden, who people kind of exhale, they go, okay, well, we can trust him. He's not Trump. He's, he's obviously more rational than him. He wouldn't just go half cocked and use, you know, launch nuclear weapons. That's a mistake because no one human being, no matter who they are, should have the ability to end life on the planet, right? And so we have to stay focused in that just because you trust somebody more than the previous person, 
Biden's not gonna be president forever. It could be Trump again, could be Ron DeSantis, and then where are we? So the issue is, is tackling these issues regardless of who's president. We've got to change no first use. We've got to change sole authority and those types of things. Um, because again, you can't just put all your eggs in whoever the president is. And again, uh, anybody, you know, the, they're gonna say whatever they can to get elected. It's the, it's the deeds, the actions that matter. Thanks. Another question. How much influence do defense companies have on the government to keep making nuclear warheads? And how would activists combat this? A ton, right? A ton. Um, <laughs> the, the amount of money that Boeing and Raytheon and Lockheed are pouring in um, to congressmen as uh, congresspeople is, is enormous. Um, and they own them, but it's not just the lobbying and the don't in the in the in the donations that they're giving the contributions. It's other things. It's the amount of money that these weapons manufacturers are giving to college and universities for research and development, um, or they'll tie it into a scholarship, or they'll tie it into a new program. And now they got these schools involved in it, right? And it's under the banner of STEM, right? The other thing is, um, I'll be up in Syracuse in a, in, in April. And when I go up there, the last time I was up there, I ran into this, where I had a lot of folks say, we're with you, Prof. The problem is Lockheed Martin is the main employer in a town like that. So find them another job. So now it's a jobs program as well that you have to get around and convince people, you know, what are you going to do on things like that? So it's a, that's a very tricky one is how do you, you know, deal with the weapons manufacturers, the money, the influence, the power that they have. Um, and, and one thing you can do that I thought was, again, done great in New York City was the divestment campaign, getting your college or university, getting your pension fund, getting, you know, all of these things to divest from nuclear weapons making manufacturers is one way. And again, that provides agency. It provides something where people feel I'm doing something tangible to try to stop this. And that gives them hope as well. Sorry, I'm trying to go as fast as I can to do rapid fire answers for you. Okay. Get many questions in, so keep them coming. Okay, we're going to keep them coming here. So, do you think that the new smaller nuclear weapons are actually less likely than others to ignite a worldwide conflagration, or even a worldwide conflagration were not to happen, uh, would not the world still be in danger of nuclear winter? I think there's low yield or smaller nuclear weapons is nonsense. Nuclear weapons are nuclear weapons. And so the reality is when we look at the power that even small ones have today, they, they dwarf what we had in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So um, no, to, to make this somehow more digestible to say we're gonna use low yield nuclear weapons is a really dangerous and scary prospect. And um, you know we know from scientists, we know from folks like, uh, I think Alan Robach is on this call. And we start looking at models of just India and Pakistan if they had a nuclear exchange, what would happen? Billions would die. What it would do, uh, it would cause another nuclear winter, what it would cause to the atmosphere, what the soot would cause, a famine, you know, with the temperature. I mean, all of these things would happen. So no, um, it is a, you know, there's no, and, and, and my fear is that, you know, if China keeps, does decide to go all in and help Russia on this, if Iran decides, does Israel then hit Iran? What happens with China? Like it can spiral out. Um, very quickly. And that's the danger here. And so I think um, we really have to do our best to educate folks and to um, influence politicians and to, you know, all of these types of things. But when I look at all the ways of doing this, uh, again, having uh, the, the treaty that, you know, so many in the world are behind, that is, to me, that's the way forward, that we really have to be all in uh, on the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And okay, thank you. Uh, comment on um, peaceful protests, but especially on an action like the Kings Bay Plowshares 7 attacking the nuclear sub base in Brunswick, Georgia. Um, you know, I would never <clears throat> tell anybody, um, especially when I'm training younger activists or organizers, what to do. Some, some folks are, you know, they're willing to put themselves on the line like that. Um, you know, I think of Byron Rustin, who was much more radical in what he wanted to do versus his white counterparts, actually, um, in this movement. Um, but that's not for everybody, right? You know, um, some people, you know, are undocumented. They can't get arrested. Um, some people, their thing isn't being out in the streets with the bullhorn like, like I was all these years, you know. Other people are really good behind the scenes, good at the research, good at the organizing, right? So I always tell younger folks, um, 
that they all have gifts and what they do with it is their gift back, right? I always tell folks, I don't have any artistic ability. I can't draw a stick figure to save my life, can't play a musical instrument. What I have is my voice, my ability to write. So if you are a writer, if you're a journalist, if you're an artist, if you're a singer, if you're a poet, use that um, to further the cause of peace in however way you can do that. You know, even if you're in the business world or if you're in the nursing world, wherever you are, that empathy, that compassion that hopefully you learn from this movement, you carry that with you into all those professions. Um, and so that's how I would look at it. But they're, extra, they're to me, the, what they've done um, with, with um, plowshares, they're heroes. You know, they're heroes. Um, I, you know, knew so many of the, uh, I knew Sister Megan Rice. Uh, to me, they're heroes. And, and, and all of those, these folks that have been willing to put their bodies on the line and face jail time and, you know, to, to, to do this. So um, there is a place for all of this. And uh, it's important that, that they know that they're supported, they're not alone, uh, and, and we deeply respect and appreciate the sacrifices that they've made. Thanks. Um, the Golden Rule, the ship by the Veterans for Peace, uh, is sailing north along the East Coast as we speak, and it will be in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, and uh, New Hampshire in June, July. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts about the effectiveness of, of uh, that particular yeah. project? I'm doing a big event with them in Baltimore. Uh, it's actually in uh, May 1st. Yeah, I'm doing a big event yeah, with them in yeah. Baltimore on May 1st. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna, I've been asked to maybe do another event with them in Annapolis and some other places. So I wrote about the golden rule um, in my first book. So I was, I'm already, you know, obviously aware of their history and their importance. Um, so I'm really excited about it. And I think it's another opportunity to engage and educate a generation that doesn't know what the golden rule is, right? Why is that what the golden rule did um, and now even continues to do, why is that deemed not part of our curriculum, right? And we're seeing this attack on, on curriculums now and, you know, and, and especially in Florida and these things. And so it's so important that we get these things in the curriculum and that students learn about them. And so this can be an opportunity since it's gonna be all over the place to really reach out to younger folks and explain this was you know, what they were, were doing and why it's important, what, it, what they were able to do and so on and so forth. Why you know, the historical legacy of nuclear testing, what is that has done to people of color, um, especially from the Marshall Islands, French Polynesia, Australian Aborigines, Native Americans, you know, um, uh, when the French test in Algeria, you can use that as a, as a teaching tool. So. Um, you know, very encouraged by it, welcome it, and very excited to, to be in Baltimore to speak with those folks and, and do an event there. And just a plug for Mass Peace Action, we will be helping to organize Massachusetts um, sites. So there'll be three in Massachusetts. So Great. very exciting. So those on the call, stay tuned, and we'll have details for you later. Um, back to the questions. <laughs> Can you do an update on uh, Steve Leeper and the Mayors for Peace effort? Oh, I can't because, I mean, I haven't spoken to Steve in a while. Um, I'm trying to think the last time I spoke with him. So I don't know, um, you know, what the what the current situation is with Mayors for Peace. Um, there are a group that I've worked with, and especially all my years when I used to travel to Japan. Um, again, I, you know, with, I've been there with Joe um, and had a couple times. And, um, but yeah, so I, I obviously, you know, Steve well know Mayors for Peace well and support their work, but I don't know currently where, where they're at on it. Okay. Um, two things. Um, we're recognizing that it is eight o'clock. And so if you must leave, do so. But uh, our speaker has generously offered to stay another 10 minutes or so. So we'll continue taking questions. Uh, please put those in the chat. And if I'm missing one, just uh, repeat it. <laughs> it just it doesn't mean we are avoiding you. It just means I didn't catch it right. Uh, so Back to the questions. So how does um, an update on, um, uh, how about contacting 60 Minutes with an update of the nuclear winter and the need for US to be a leader in no first use and sign the QPNW? So. Um, yeah, I'm not that, uh, I'm, I'm not that big of a name to get 60 minutes to care. So you're going to have to get bigger than me. Um, I don't think they'd be picking up my phone call anytime soon, but if we can get to things to a point of critical mass, then yeah, it would be great if, you know, they could get involved. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, again, when you have, um, 
people worried about this now. This is when we need the big names to kind of, we need people to step up and really put this front and center. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm hoping one thing that will get the media involved um, in that regard is if we plan correctly and organize around it, maybe we can get some significant panels and discussions on mainstream media when the Oppenheimer film comes out by Christopher Nolan in the summer. Um, you know, that's a blockbuster movie. It's based on Marty and Kai's book, which is great. Hopefully, you know, it, it, it really kind of sparks a conversation. Um, you think about the day after, right, in the 80s, 100 million people watched it, but it was the follow-up panels on all the channels that they had afterwards, right? So maybe if we organize around that, have screenings of it, perhaps, invite local media politicians, but maybe the Oppenheimer film will be uh, a way to uh, to kind of open that up to mainstream media. That, that would be a possibility. Do you happen to know the date that that will be released? I want to say in July the first it's the trailers are up and it says it on there I want to say the first week of July but I'm not 100% positive okay all right it looks phenomenal and again if they stick to Marty and Kai's book then I I have high hopes for it I I absolutely love, um, have July 21st down so I, I mean I think Christopher Nolan is the director so I think it's going to be you know really well done good thanks very much and who are our best allies in the U.S. Congress uh in Congress oh um Okay. Obviously, McGovern uh, and Markey, Jamie Raskin, Barbara Lee, um, um, Ilya, Ilya, yes, Ilya Omar. Um, so I, I think the kind of usual suspects that you think, but I, I think that it's also important that for those that are, we view as allies, that we make it clear to them that we got their back. I think Adam Smith balked a little bit over, um, you know, how much he should go all in on this because uh, he put his neck on the line, you know, and some people kind of pulled back on the support there. And I think that we've got to, the people that are not uh, in favor, the, the Tom Cottons of the world, that we got to do everything we can to champion their opponents. And then the ones that are, you know, but I think also here's an, another opening is that for a long time, and I wrote about this in the first book, the Congressional Black Caucus were the leaders on this, right? Um, and so maybe it's time to kind of go back to the Congressional Black Caucus, you know, uh, and say, okay, it's time for them to champion this once again. And, and what do we need to do to catch their back and make sure that they come out and realize how these things directly affect their constituents and their communities. So, um, yep. Okay. okay. Uh, do you have suggestions about how to talk with teens and preteens about the dangers of nukes? Yes. Um, there is I'm reluctant option. ever to bring up the subject because it's so terrifying. There is, so there isn't one way. First of all, um, we have got to bring this up to contemporary times. I have been on talks like this where, you know, the, and I've heard, you know, and not this particular talk, but I've heard others where they go, okay, we want to, uh, we really got to reach out and get more youth involved and, and, and different demographics involved. Let's start out the whole thing by playing a Pete Seeger song. Well, I love me some Pete Seeger as much as the next guy, but no kid who's 18 years old gives a damn about Pete Seeger right now. So we've got to relate to them where, meet them where they are. So for some, I relate to them by talking about sports because I know they're into sports. And we talk about socially conscious athletes comparing LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony and Kaepernick to Muhammad Ali and Tommy Smith and John Carlos. And then I can crowbar in Athletes United for Peace and we can talk about it. I can talk about Jojo Washington and Marianne Washington and other um, uh, people that were involved. For some who are involved in music, I look up and I know the hip hop artists of today that talk about this issue in their music and I can talk about it. For my students who are from various parts of Africa, when I talk about African leaders, when I start talking about the comments that Salazi made over the years in Ethiopia about nuclear disarmament, then my Ethiopian students perk up, right? When I talk about what Kwame Nkrumah did in Ghana, my students from Ghana perk up. So you have to find my, my graphic design students, my students care about video games. When we talk about, um, um, and we talk about uh, uh, games for change, they perk up. So you have to find different ways to reach them. You know, um, I have to tell a story a couple of years ago in Baltimore, they were telling parents to bring in space heaters because they had no heat for their kids in public schools. Well, that's the opportunity where I can go and talk to them about spending a trillion dollars on nuclear weapons, how these things are connected. And now they buy in. 
Now they have skin in the game. Now they realize, right? So there's things like that that um, you know you can do, but it's not one message. It's not one thing. So you got to figure out different ways of getting to them. Um, and that's you know that's how I've always kind of how I've always kind of done it. You got to make it. This is one thing that I can has done so well. They made it cool. Branding, marketing, social media—it matters. I mean, 